these slides? These slides are posted, yes. Okay. Because I just downloaded them, actually. Alright, because I don't have I need the homework. It's all up on Canvas. So homework, stars mean hard. So the test breakdown. Um, so like I said, I quite literally spent this weekend, yesterday, and today going through trying to adjust the test, get all the points assigned, all that kind of fun stuff. So it is 150 points. I think if I did this total right, uh, you should hit 144, and that's because I didn't put the nomenclature questions in there. So currently there's six points strictly on nomenclature. Uh, I can increase that if you want, um, but I'm not going to go any higher than 10 points. Does anybody care? Six versus 10. You want 10? 10. We'll see what we can do. I'll go through and try and pull points from other questions to get uh, more nomenclature in there. So as far as the general breakdown, looking at 12 pages, um, general knowledge which can fit into individual chapters, and for the most part, you should already know what general knowledge questions I might ask. What kind of general knowledge questions do you think you would be expected Bronsted to know? Bronsted and Lewis. And Bronsted definitions, Lewis definitions, nucleophiles, electrophiles, nucleophiles. Okay, that would be general knowledge that I fully expect you to know. And just for the heck of it, we might as well test you on it to begin with. Okay, so kind of give me points at that point. Okay, so you should be able to immediately see those and write some information down. The rest of the test requires pretty strict application of those definitions. So this way I can at least guarantee that somewhere you have those definitions written down. Okay? What other kind of general knowledge things do you think I might ask? So reaction types is something I considered putting on there, but that's a little bit more organic specific. Be ideal that if you left this class, you had some idea of how different things could react. Knowing the definition of what an individual reaction is doesn't particularly help you out. Electronegativity. So it could come back to electronegativity, and it's going to be applying the definitions, acids and bases, nucleophiles, electrophiles, to organic compounds. Okay? That was your second quiz in this class, the one that Jay sat in on um, and helped you guys with. And it was on your last exam. Given individual functional groups, tell me what sites of reactivity are within each of those functional groups. Okay? Because that's ultimately one of the biggest things that you should be picking up from this class, is knowing that reactivity. Yes? On those where you gave us a compound, is there always one nucleophile and one electrophile? No. So, because you had one where it was like carbon, oxygen, and the hydrogen? Yes. Could the hydrogen and the carbon both be electrophiles? So let's go through. That is probably the most complex functional group that we could deal with. What functional group are you referring to? Um, let me find it. Or I'm drawing it. You don't have to look it up. The CH3, it's an alcohol. The alcohol is probably the most complex functional group because you've got tons of possible sites of reactivity. That oxygen is highly electronegative, which messes with pretty much everything. Okay, so we've got all sorts of different things that can happen in here. Where would you like to start as far as labeling your reactivity? So if we start with the oxygen, what does the oxygen have a bunch of? Electrons. electrons. What species have electrons? Okay, there are lots of them. You got Lewis base, you had Bronsted base, and nucleophiles. So there we go. That gives us the oxygen. Is there anything else that's reactive within that structure? You do have the hydrogen out here. Now as far as determining that, why is that hydrogen reactive? Because the high electronegativity of the oxygen, which is pulling the electrons in the bond away from the hydrogen, meaning the hydrogen becomes partially positive, which is very similar to H+, which ultimately means a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Can I label that as anything else? Okay, it could potentially accept electrons, but when we're looking at those definitions, does it make sense to look at H plus as an electron acceptor or as H plus? H plus. So the better definition is going to be sit and call that a Bronsted acid. Okay, as far as the reactivity and avoiding looking at your nucleophile, electrophile, or Lewis definitions. 
What else is reactive in this structure? Why is the carbon reactive? It's partially positive because the electronegative of oxygen. Okay, so what could that carbon act as? Okay, it can act as an electrophile. What else? Lewis acid, so it can accept electrons. What else? Do you count the hydrogens that are attached to it? So what atom did we circle? The carbon. Okay, is the carbon going to fit as a Bronsted-Lowry acid? No, because it's not looking at protons. Okay, now is it not partially or a positive hydrogen, but it can't accept positive hydrogens. Why not? It's a positive charge. It's partially positive to begin with. Okay. Should we look at the hydrogens that are attached there? It's possible to go ahead and look at them, but we're going to find out that they're not very reactive. Why are they not very reactive? Look at the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Is there a difference in electronegativity there? No. no. So what functional group are we ultimately comparing if we look at just the carbon and hydrogen? Alkane reactivity. What's the reactivity of an alkane? Non-reactive as far as you guys are concerned. We didn't look at any reactions with them. Okay? Make sense? You guys understand that breakdown on how you should be approaching each of those? Okay. Um, so that's your general knowledge stuff. Then you move into chapter one. That's where hybridization shows up. Um, I just completely blanked the rest of chapter one. Lewis structures. Um, Newman projections is actually chapter three. Um, what else was in chapter one? Maybe it's just hybrid. Oh, orbitals. So hybridization theory, identifying sp3, sp2. Um, what types of orbitals? How did you make those hybrid orbitals? That kind of fun stuff. Okay. As far as point breakdown, so general knowledge was 12 points. Chapter 1 was 16 points. Oh, well, that's not the number of questions. That's it's the not point. the number of questions, number of points. Yeah. Okay. We'll get to the number of point or questions in, in a second. <laughs> chapter 2. <laughs> chapter 2 is worth um, about 7 points. That's where you're looking at your Lewis or your acid definitions um, and some intermolecular force definitions as well. Okay. So most of the questions from chapter 2 have already been discussed back in the general knowledge. Okay. Uh, chapter 3 is where we looked at cyclohexanes, Newman projections, that kind of fun stuff. Okay. So you're going to have to be comfortable with those still. Chapter 6 was your stereochemistry. You get about 10 points there. Chapter 7. Wait. Yes. Write all this down. You're not so Are you going to do chair stuff? So let me, uh, maybe I should take notes while we're going. So chapter three was your cyclohexanes and Newman. As to your question about chairs, where do cyclohexanes go? What conformation are they most stable in? Chairs. chairs. So do we have chair questions? Yes. Yes. It's coming from our cyclohexanes. Axial equatorial. Axial equatorial, all of those repercussions, yes. Yes, you are allowed to use the model kit on the exam if you so choose. Okay? I would recommend that when you start the exam, you have uh, methyl cyclohexane <coughs> built. If you've got questions about putting things together, you can ask, and I can help you put it together before the exam, too. Okay? Except you. Can't help you. Appreciate that. Sorry. I apologize. You can still bring a model kit. I'll just uh, Chapter 6 was looking at stereochemistry. Okay, what were the big lessons from stereochemistry? RNS, anantiomers, an antimers, meso compounds, diastereomers, structural isomers, meso, identical and different. Not in that order necessarily. Okay? Got a little flow chart there. Yes. Understanding and manipulating that flow chart is going to help out a lot. Okay. Um, unfortunate thing with stereochemistry is that's going to sh continue to show up. With each of those individual reactions that we dealt with, 
we had stereochemistry show up. So what's a big red flag that you should be paying attention for stereochemistry? Chiral carbons. How do you know they're chiral? You find an atom anywhere, be it in the product that you're drawing or somewhere in the starting material that has four different things attached to it. Okay. Where does it become difficult to remember that you've got four different things attached? Hydrogens. Remember, your hydrogens are almost always implied. So when we look for hydrogens, when we look at an individual structure, you might only see three things immediately. You have to remember there are implied hydrogens. Okay, so watch out for those. Um, the other big thing that you could see as a red flag, if you see wedges and dashes, that's probably also a red flag that stereochemistry is at least being asked. I might very well add a wedge or a dash into a structure just to trick you into answering, oh, it's R and S, even though it doesn't have four different things. So make sure you look for those things. You're looking for wedges and dashes, and it must have four different things attached, four distinguishable things. Check. I hate Fisher projections. So we're not going to worry about that. Um, that was one of the things I was hoping to get into in fact, this week was when we were supposed to talk about some stuff like Fisher projections, but that's not happening. Chapter 7 was looking at alkyl halide reactivity, which ultimately meant the SN reactions and the E reactions. So SN1, SN2 versus E1, E2. Okay. What's a red flag that you're dealing with an elimination reaction? Heat and bases. Okay. The tricky thing with bases is that a base can also act as a nucleophile. <laughs> Did you say an acid? No. Okay. What did you say? Why is that acid? Okay, so your bases can act as both nucleophiles and bases. So you got to watch out for that when you deal with those reactions. So go back through and review those. I will try, um, since the exam is done by Thursday, to put together slides for a review, which will be the goal for Thursday's lecture, complete, comprehensive review of everything. Um, chapter 4, 5, and 8, I kind of just grouped all together. 4 and 5 really should be just one chapter. Um, and then 8 is looking at alcohol chemistry. So what we're looking at in 4 and 5 was ultimately your addition reactions. Okay, or your alkenes. Chapter 8 was looking at alcohol reactivity. All the alcohol reactions either involved the formation of alkenes or it was a substitution elimination reaction, something like that. Okay, or acid base. Okay. Chapter 9 was horrible. Are you asking like Remember what the chapters are? Yeah, why not? You're looking at aromatic structures, so you had to identify aromaticity, and then you're also looking for EAS reactions. Okay, so where are those electrophiles coming from? How do they react with the ring? Is that a question? No. no. Last thing is chapter 13, which is the last section of material, which is why it's the, worth the largest amount of points. You're looking at 39 points. And that's broken up primarily into our three main categories. Alcohols, or sorry, oxygens reacting as nucleophiles with carbonyls, carbons reacting as nucleophiles, and nitrogens reacting as nucleophiles. We'll finish up the discussion on carbon and nitrogens tonight, um, and then we'll try and see how much time we've got to review the rest of the material. And that would be kind of the et cetera thing. Okay. Most of those questions... Uh, we haven't had direct lectures on, but it's in reference to the functional groups we've already looked at. So it's applying that functional group knowledge to a new problem. Okay. Um, one of the things that would show up in that, et cetera, would be chapter 10, which was your amines. So reactivity of nitrogens. What was the reactivity of nitrogens? Bases. Okay. That was our primary concern with those. So that is pretty much everything. Um, like I said, I'll try and organize a review that goes through everything um, for Thursday. Okay, it'll just be a lot of copy and paste. Did you end up 
did it end up being about 50% of the questions are? As far as repeating questions, it came out to be like 49.7%. Or just the copy and paste from previous tests. Copy and paste or making them shorter, like multiple choice or true false. We even added converted some of them into true false. Okay. Okay. As far as multiple choice goes, um, they're interspersed with the questions, and it's not just a section of straight multiple choice. Okay, so no scantrons, so just fill it out on the the sheet, just like every other exam. Okay? How many questions are in multiple choice? I don't have a number count as far as total questions. It's 40. So, yeah. With parts as always. Hour and 50 minutes. Yeah, time will have to be called at two hours. Yeah. So I plan on letting it extend to two hours, um, but ideally you should be done in an hour and 50. And at two hours, I'm going to have to boot you. That will be the end of it. Okay? So, remember, half of it is copied. Okay? It's brand, or it's not new material. So you only got 40 questions that are actually new material. 20 questions. Sorry, 40 points. Which is something like, I think it's actually only 10 to 15 questions. So 40 points is new material? 40 points is new material. <laughs> Okay. Um, you are still allowed the eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper as a cheat sheet for the exam. So you're more than welcome to write that up. I would recommend writing down all the individual reactions so that you can pull that information from it. You can expect to see a lot more synthesis questions and a lot more um, predict the product, reagent, starting material things. Okay. So the questions that almost everybody hates, but a lot more of those are showing up. Okay, so questions about the exam? Good, save them for Thursday. Oh, nice. Nucleophiles, so, what? So what we're gonna look at now is starting with our carbonyl, and what we wanna do is instead of starting with an oxygen nucleophile, which we went through and evaluated with our acetals and hemiacetals, we want to have a carbon act as a nucleophile. What was the definition of a nucleophile? Negatively charged. Positive loving. Yeah. Well, that's going to be fun to grade. So we're looking for <laughs> negatively charged, positive loving. Glad I'm not the only one. That's a direct translation? Right. Positive loving. Yeah. So Do we deal with so positive charges when we're dealing with Organic chemistry, when we look at a mechanism, what do we look at the flow of? Electrons. So we don't care about that it's positive loving. What we're looking at is that it is electron donor. Okay. All of those definitions work. I'll give you full credit for it. Um, but ideally, we're getting into those two-word definitions. Okay, short and sweet. Um, so I need to somehow make... Carbon negative. How easy is it to make carbon negative? Not very easy at all. Why not? It's not very electronegative, which means it's not going to take electrons away from anything. If we look at our standard structures, okay, so let's pick, um, why not? If we pick something along these lines, just a standard alkane. Okay. Hydrogen, as far as we're concerned, has the lowest electronegativity that we've really evaluated in organic chemistry. So we could put carbon around a bunch of hydrogens. That's going to make that carbon as negative as we could get it at this point, except what is the difference in electronegativity? Very, very small. So what are the odds that carbon is going to be able to take the electrons away from hydrogen? Not very likely at all. Okay. So what we're going to have to do is somehow come up with a way to make that carbon negative. Okay? So to start off with, we're going to have to make it reactive to begin with, because the alkane itself is not reactive, so we're going to have to change the structure. Yeah. So we could go through and tweak the hybridization. So if we change the hybridization of that carbon to SP, 
So we went from SP3 to SP. The hybridization change is enough to cause the electronegativity to go up that that carbon is now, or that hydrogen is now relatively acidic. And we can pull off that hydrogen, making the carbon negative. Yellow is a bad color. Okay? That gives us our negative carbon. So that works out well as a potential carbon nucleophile. Okay? And we've addressed that one a couple times. So that's looking at that triple bond. Okay? There's other ways that we can go ahead and make that carbon negative. Okay? And it's going to involve some trickier chemistry. So pretty much what happens is we went through, did all the organic chemistry we could, and then realized that we aren't taking full advantage of the periodic table. So we're going to open up our periodic table options. Okay? So instead of looking at just our carbons and hydrogens and halogens, we're going to start to look at our metals. Okay? And what some guy was able to find was that if we started with a halogenated compound, bromide seems to work the best. And what he ended up doing for some reason, I have no idea why, he added magnesium metal. Okay. Why would you add it? Add it and see what happens. Okay. So added that species to it, and what he ended up finding was he created a very, very reactive intermediate. Okay, and what ends up happening is that that magnesium will react with our, uh, in this case, methyl bromide. And it inserts itself between the, the carbon and bromine bond. Okay. Well, what kind of bonds do we have now between the magnesium and the bromine and the carbon and the magnesium? We have an ionic bond, one of those kind of important intermolecular forces that determines all chemistry. Okay? So if we can predict what type of bond we've got, we can now predict the intermolecular forces and all that fun stuff. If it's an ionic bond, what does that mean about the bromine? What charge would it likely be? Negative. negative. Why is it only negative one? So all the way back to your general chemistry, you can really only accept one electron. So it becomes negative 1. What happens to the magnesium? It's going to end up being positive. But positive, or a magnesium that's positive, means it gave up just one electron. We have a second ionic bond, which means there's a positive associated with the bromine side, and there's a positive associated with the carbon side. So what's the charge on the magnesium? We're looking at a plus 2 overall charge on that magnesium. Okay, why is that really important? What happens to that carbon now? It has to be a negative to balance Our overall structure is neutral. Okay, for that carbon to balance out our charge, that carbon has to be negatively charged. Okay? So what you're responsible for is realizing that when you take magnesium magnesium metal, and you react it with uh, a hollow alkane, the magnesium inserts in between that carbon uh, halide bond, and we end up forming a really good nucleophile. Okay. Why is that helpful? Well, let's go back and take a look at our carbonyl. So let's look at our possibilities for our carbonyl. Okay. Let's say this was an aldehyde. How would I make that carbonyl an aldehyde? One of my bonds out has to be a hydrogen. Let's say we went ahead and made this methyl Grignard reagent. Okay. So we've got our CH3. It's an ionic bond, so as far as we're concerned, the effective relationship is that I have that species floating around. I've got my nucleophile. Does carbon want to be negatively charged? No. So what can that negatively charged species do? Okay. It's going to want to hook up with a positive charge. What kind of species or what kind of positive things could it hook up with? Could hook up with a carbon, in which case our, nucleo or our CH3- is acting as? A nucleophile. 
or a Lewis base. Okay. If we have electrons, could it act as something else? Could also act as a Bronsted base. We'll evaluate that one in a second. It has electrons. But it has electrons, it can act as a Bronsted base. What does that mean? I thought it was Lewis had to do with electrons, and Bronsted had to do with protons. Yes, but what does it donate those electrons to? A hydrogen. So if you find negative charge, it can be a Bronsted base, Lewis base nucleophile every single time. Okay? So let's take a look at this circumstance. What do we have in our solution here? We've got this aldehyde. Where's our most positive atom? Okay, our central carbon ends up being partially positive. Why is it partially positive? Because the oxygen attached to it. So what happens? We'll take our negative, react with our positive. So our methyl anion is going to share electrons. How many bonds would that central carbon now have? Too many. So what do we need to do? Break a bond. We'll break our double bond. Why the double bond? It's the easiest one to break. Okay. What's our product of that step? Our oxygen becomes negative. Why? Because it took the electrons. What happens to our carbon? I guess I should be more specific. What happens to um, our now red carbon? Neutral. It's neutral. Started negative. It shared electrons. So it lost electrons. It's now neutral. What happened to our now green carbon in the middle? It's still neutral. It's probably still partially positive. Okay. But at this point, we've neutralized all of our charges. We've got a negative charge that went from a carbon to being on an oxygen. Is this step a favorable reaction? Yes. Yes. Why? Because the carbon is neutral. Or more neutral than it was in the start. Right idea. We still have a negative charge, though, so it's still reactive. Why is our product... Oxygen would rather be negative than carbon. So this reaction would be expected to progress forward. We're looking at where that charge ends up. The charge is ending up on a better atom. That makes sense. Okay. If I still had a bunch of these things in solution, they would continue to react with each other. Let's say I had an excess of the CH3. Okay. Do I have another positive atom where it could react? Less than yes. No. no. Okay. If we tried to react with any other thing, we could try and pull off the hydrogen, but then we put a negative charge on our green central atom. That's not a good option. Okay. We could try and have the CH3 come in and attack our partially positive carbon. But then we still have too many bonds. What bond can we break? Okay. Is hydrogen willing to take the electron? No, so we can't break off the hydrogen. How about O minus? Can O minus take the electrons and form O minus 2 as a leaving group? That's really, really charged. That's a bad option. How about kicking out a CH3? Well, we just did that, so that was pretty useless. So what happens? Nothing. The reaction stops. Okay. So at this point, we've formed an intermediate, not particularly stable. So what we'll end up doing is doing a second step. So whenever we run these reactions, we always do a second step. And that second step is going to be to add... Any guesses? What's the reactivity of our intermediate? What can that species act as? It could act as a base. So what should we react it with? An acid. You'll almost always see H3O plus written as the next step. What happens? We protonate our oxygen and we end up with an alcohol functional group. So we can convert our aldehyde 
into an alcohol. Can we classify that alcohol? That was a dumb question. Secondary. If you classify that alcohol for me, you find out it's a secondary alcohol. Okay? So what we're looking at, again, is the reactivity of our nucleophile coming in and reacting with our carbonyl to produce a product. Okay? You'll notice to begin with, to form the Grignard reagent, I didn't show you a mechanism. Any ideas why? Because it sucks. <laughs> well, actually, it's kind of cool, but it's going to be more confusing than it's worth trying to show. Okay? So it doesn't make sense to go through and worry about it. You're not responsible for it. <coughs> what you are responsible for realizing is that if you react that halogen or that halide compound with magnesium, magnesium intercalates and you get your Grignard reagent. Okay? So let's look through some other options. What if we started with, instead of an aldehyde, stop it, started with a ketone. Um, not quite, I lied, sorry. We'll come back to the ketone in a second. So let's work through how you might see this on an exam. You could say CH3Br, first step of the reaction. Trying to make carbon a nucleophile, what do we have to do in our very first step? We have to add the magnesium. What's the second step of our reaction? Attacking the our carbonyl. So let's put in our ketone. What would our third step have to be? Our third step is the addition of that acid. Okay, and then we could show our arrow. So what would the product of this overall reaction be? Now that we've got all those individual pieces out there. Okay, so we could draw in the box, and you would be expected to give me what that answer is. How should you approach this problem? What's that? Do each of those individual steps. So our very first step gives us Okay, so there's our nucleophilic species, so we can go ahead and erase the Grignard part because it's just confusing. So there we go, there's our nucleophile. What does that nucleophile react with? Where's our positive? What does that end up producing? Our CH3. Our reaction stalls. So with our next step, we add the acid and we end up with our final product, which is everybody agree with that statement? Mm -hmm. Interesting. We do have an alcohol, but now it's a tertiary alcohol. Okay? When we change the functional group, when we change the reactivity of our carbonyl, we get a different resulting product. If we started with the aldehyde, we got a secondary alcohol. If we start with the ketone, we get a tertiary alcohol. Okay? How could we get a primary alcohol? Are you guys done with what's written up there? Or should I pause? Okay, we'll accept that. How can I get a primary alcohol? So now, oh man, shouldn't have erased all that. I want let's not do that, that's a bit mean. You don't have an edit a do option for I do every so often I figure it out. How can I get a primary alcohol? Um, 
Okay, what bond was formed? When we're dealing with our carbon nucleophile, the bond that we formed was our carbon-carbon bond. The last step, whoops, the last step was our OH bond. Okay, hey, let's color code this. So, our OH bond came from using 3 H3O+. Plus. Okay, what happened in our second step? Okay, I had to have this carbon, these two hydrogens, and this oxygen, okay, to react with my Grignard reagent, which was out here. Okay, so what do I do? I draw my carbon with my two hydrogens and my oxygen. This material was in what chapter? Our chapter 13, carbonyl chemistry. And we get our primary alcohol. What was our first step? The formation of our Grignard reagent from magnesium and... What piece are we missing? Okay. Okay, so the chemistry is definitely getting a lot more difficult in this chapter. You're looking at multiple things happening. In the course of this reaction, we're doing that very first step is what? Magnesium inserting into the bromine. Kind of a substitution reaction, kind of not really. Our second step is an addition reaction. We're taking two species and we're adding them together. And we lose the double bond. And our last step is an acid-base reaction. Okay? So all of those individual reactions that we've been doing throughout the semester, we're now compiling all into individual types or larger reaction schemes. So that's why you need to be comfortable with those reactions so you can build outwards from this. Okay? Ready for one more example on this? We'll make it another predict. I want you to make... Still Grignard chemistry, so don't cheat and use something else. What bonds were likely formed in this reaction? So let's. Slow it down. What bonds were formed total in our Grignard reaction? We had two new bonds formed. What were those two bonds? We had a hydrogen to oxygen bond, so that bond has to be it. That's the only one we've got. And you can go even better than that, carbon to carbon. Just make it simple. So those are our two new bonds that end up forming in this reaction. Our hydrogen bond had to be formed how? The acid addition of H3O+. Plus. Okay. This piece versus our carbon in the middle. Which of those do you think is more likely our positive electrophile? Carbon in the middle, our green one. Why? Look at all the atoms attached to it. That carbon is definitely going to be our positive carbon, that green one, because it already has very electronegative elements attached to it, which means the other one has to be our, our nucleophile or our Grignard reagent. So our very starting material is probably going to be that benzene ring. We have to have that bromo group on it so that it can react with our magnesium. Okay, now we have to go through and evaluate that last carbonyl piece. 
Okay, so we've got our carbon. Okay, let's draw on that oxygen was where our carbonyl came from originally, right? So let's draw that carbon-oxygen double bond. What other things are attached to that carbon? Another double bonded oxygen. What material did we add? CO2. Where's the carbonyl in CO2? There's two of them. Okay? So being able to look for that reactivity and finding those individual pieces takes some practice, but it's a question of looking for each of those stepwise, moving through it, and trying to identify them. Okay? Questions about that? Okay? Can I summarize all of those? You said the ring I don't be understand. Nucleophile? Just a sec. You said the ring would be a nucleophile? The ring will act as your nucleophile, yes. So this is where your carbon acting as a nucleophile with your carbonyls. Okay, so it's coming from chapter 13. There's our chapter 13 material, the carbonyl. The next section is carbons as nucleophiles. We make carbons as nucleophiles by doing the Grignard formation. And that's the blue part. Yes? I don't understand the statement. There's two carbonyls in the CO2. What makes a carbonyl? Oh, the C double bond. Oh, never mind. There's one there and other side. Okay. Other questions with this? Why do we have to know this? Because it's on the test. <laughs> this question. There was an answer. Always go. I wouldn't say it's a thirst. Okay. It's a question of looking for the reactivity and trying to identify how things move. Why do you need it for anything that you're ever going to study in the rest of your life? You don't need this material. What you need is how you solve these problems. You have to be able to identify where things changed, how things changed. That's all this is. It's problem solving 101, except we call it organic chemistry. Everybody, guaranteed, whatever position you're moving into, you're going to have to solve problems. Okay? And what we're trying to teach you to do is to be able to excel at whatever field you're trying to get into, get to the absolute maximum. If you don't want the absolute maximum, that's fine. You don't have to do that. Okay? But this material is to get you to that absolute best position you can be at. Okay? And if you don't want to be there, then don't study it. It's not, that's not my problem, unfortunately. Okay? So, other questions about it? So, if you're, if you're given the First, yes, so you would have to be familiar with this being a Grignard question, okay? Because there's other ways that we could make this species, mm -hmm. okay? So if I came in and force-fed that you're starting off with bromobenzene, magnesium, and H3O, what I would ask is what species is here? Okay. Because okay. that's the variant. That would be the one variable. In this case, we're going all the way from the beginning to end, or from end to beginning, all the way through, because I'm telling you it's a Grignard reaction. Okay? So what we've got to do is look for the patterns in each of those reactions. And in each case, our last step, step was the addition of hydrogen, okay? which was an acid reaction. So we'd have to go back and say, where was a hydrogen added? We could add it to each of those individual carbons, except is that a very likely position to be reactive? Why not? Those carbons would all have to be negative. Is that a nice intermediate? No. So what would we have to do? We have to look for a position that can hold a negative charge as an intermediate. What atom can hold a negative charge? Oxygen. Why? It's electronegative. So which hydrogen was most likely added in the last step? Right there. The next part is trying to work your way further backwards. When we dealt with carbons as nucleophiles, we form what? A carbon-carbon bond. Okay, that's why the Grignard reaction is so powerful and important, is it's very rare to form carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, why is it rare? How often do you see positives and negative carbons? Okay, doesn't happen very often. 
Okay, so if we want to build a larger structure, we need those carbon-carbon bonds. The best way to get a hold of that is in the Grignard reagent or dealing with acetylenes. Okay, so that means somewhere in this structure, I have to break a carbon-carbon bond if I'm going to work my way backwards. What's going to be the easiest carbon-carbon bond to break? Well, find them all. Carbon-carbon double bonds within a ring or a carbon-carbon bond that's a single bond outside the ring. The outside one's going to be the easiest to break, which means more than likely that was the bond I formed when I reacted my Grignard reagent. So now we have to try and break this even further apart and see what pieces we can work with there. Okay? Do we look at the carbon that's in green here being our nucleophile, our Grignard reagent, or do we look at our benzene ring carbon being our nucleophile? Well, to be a nucleophile, what does it need? Negative. Negative. It needs to have electrons. Which of those two carbons has more electrons already? The benzene ring, which means more than likely the benzene ring has to be the nucleophile. So I can take that part out and say, okay, that's going to be my Grignard reagent. How do I make my Grignard reagent? I needed a carbon containing a halogen reacting with magnesium. So can it, be, it doesn't have to be bromine, it has to be a halogen. It has to be a halogen. Bromine's the most common. Okay, why would we use bromine more often? Better leaving group. So in most cases, you see bromine show up because it's easier to work with. Okay. So what does that mean? We've accounted for the benzene ring half and the hydrogen half. What's the only piece left? The middle piece. So somehow or another, I have to convert that piece into my reactive carbonyl. Okay. Do I show the carbonyl? Should that be the, the starting piece? Is that the reactive carbonyl? Why not? That's one good guess. The hydrogen isn't attached to it. The hydrogen during our Grignard reaction was added to our carbonyl oxygen. So if that one doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it, probably wasn't the one that was reactive. Okay, what else? What does a carbonyl look like to start with? C double bond oxygen. What do we have at the end here? C double bond oxygen. Did it change? No. Is that likely something to react if it didn't change? No, which means we're going to be looking for our carbonyl, our carbon-oxygen double bond, coming from the other oxygen. We know it's Grignard's. We know our Grignard's react with carbonyls. So what we'll do is break that hydrogen-oxygen bond, turn it into an oxygen-carbon double bond. We have to account for the rest of the bonds around that carbon or the rest of the atoms. What are the rest of the atoms in this case? Oxygen and a doubly bound one. There it is. I don't touch it. Okay? Does that make sense? So it's the processing through each of these pieces that you need to be able to recognize. And yes, it's all new material, and that makes it difficult. Okay? But that's why you take, you practice with it. Yes? Yes. Which caused the magnesium to jump between the carbon and the bromine bond. Yes. Where did the magnesium and the bromine go? Did you put it in a solution to make... To so to you're to asking to make it dissociate. So that is actually probably a lot more complicated than you want to hear, but we'll so give you a brief, that it, that it, cause I a brief explanation for this. So if you've got your bromine and your magnesium, what you're asking about is once we form the Grignard reagent... And that's the intermediate, the magnesium bond. This would be an, a reactive intermediate. The very next step, I show that Grignard reagent doing something, right? Reacting with a carbonyl. Let's you say it was... Show, show it with a but then I don't show the MGBR, right? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? There's a couple reasons why we don't look at that. Primary reason? It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, why doesn't it matter? Because it's not carbon. There's no carbon, or so it's not organic. So we'll ignore it for that reason. Okay. Um, it is still technically floating around in solution. And at this stage, remember we said that magnesium was plus two. So what's the charge of MGBR? Plus one. Plus one. 
What would a plus charge help stabilize? A negative. The negative charge on our intermediate. So, instead of the hydrogen. so we could, well, so before we add the hydrogen, that magnesium can coordinate and help stabilize it. Okay, to facilitate the formation of that last step. Okay, because that negative charge is still reactive. As far as what it's doing and why I ignore it right after that part, okay, because effectively that acts as the negative charged carbon, and that part we do end up ignoring later on. So I decide to cut out the middleman and ignore it straight from the beginning. Okay. Okay. That in solution is a massive mess of crystalline structure, um, and they're all tightly in intercalated and, re and organized next to each other to stabilize because you're forming a negatively charged carbon. Negatively charged carbons aren't stable, so it has to form a very large extended structure to stabilize, and that's what those magnesiums are helping to do. Okay, does that make sense with that one? No, that was a good question. It's just more than I think you want. So if there's a lot of magnesium bromide in there, if there's a ton, you, it would satisfy that negative charge and you wouldn't be able to yes. add the H3O plus and it wouldn't be No, what type of bond do you have there between magnesium and oxygen? Ionic. How strong is an ionic bond versus a polar covalent bond? It's weaker than a covalent bond. A ionic force is stronger than hydrogen bonding force. But when you look at the strength of the bond in solution, your ionic bond is very, very weak. So it would dissociate almost immediately as soon as you added that hydrogen. Yep. Okay. So the last thing that we'll address when it comes to your carbon nucleophiles is probably one of the more difficult aspects, which we mentioned, right, or not necessarily difficult. But we said there was one other portion of reactivity with this. Okay, so let's just jump to our carbon nucleophile. How did we say that could react? We had nucleophile and Lewis base and our biggest issue, our Bronsted Lowry base. Why is that important? What reaction is easier, acid-base reactions or Lewis acid-base reactions with our nucleus? Acid-base reactions are very, very quick and easy. Why? You're transferring a hydrogen atom versus what's happening in the other cases. Not just electrons. What's changed positions? We've changed the location of that carbon atom. That carbon atom has to get near... So if we take a look at our options here, a carbonyl carbon, no, it's not quite big enough. Let's make that a little bigger. We look at our carbonyl carbon versus, say that. What changes in each case? The top one, I have to get that carbon in near a whole bunch of other carbons. What has to happen with the other case? Just near a hydrogen which is easier to get access to? The hydrogen. Okay? Your acid-base reactions, your Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reactions are extremely fast. Okay? So in most cases, they are almost always competing with your reactions. Okay? But when we dealt with oxygens, we could have hydrogens come on and off relatively easily without too much stress. And that's because that bond was relatively weak. What happens if we form a carbon Hydrogen bond, though. How weak is that bond? No. Not very weak. There's, or sorry. Not very weak. No, that was right. Yeah. So it's relatively strong. There's no polarity associated with that bond. Which means once that bond is formed, what are the odds I'm going to be able to go the reverse direction? Very, very, very small. Okay? So this is one of the biggest issues with carbons as nucleophiles is we have to be very, very careful about what conditions we put them in. We have to make sure that the situation or the environment that they're in is where they can only act as nucleophiles. Okay, so how do I limit its ability to act as a base? What do bases need to react with? 
acid. So how do I prevent my nuclear or my Grignard reagent from acting as a base? Don't put in any acids. Okay. So what things would be acids? Here's a carbonyl. Would I expect this reagent to react in a Grignard fashion? Would I be able to put the carbon in there? Is that a particularly likely reaction to occur? No, why not? So I like that you're pointing out the OH, but I'd like it a little bit better if you pointed out what functional group is that? Carboxylic. Carboxylic acid. Would we expect the carbonyl of the acid to react? No. What ends up happening? We get an acid-base reaction instead. Okay? How about if I started with another compound? So let's say we've got our carbonyl, and now let's go a little bit further away, put an OH. So now it's not a carboxylic acid anymore. Would I expect that carbonyl to react? That alcohol is still acidic enough, and what happens? You get the acid-base reaction again. Okay? So when we react or when we use Grignard reagents, we have to watch out and make sure that the environment that we're in does not have acidic hydrogens. Okay, this is going to be a more difficult question. Where might we see acidic hydrogen showing up? Electronegative elements. Okay, electronegative elements. Go even more generic based on the reaction itself. Alcohols. Alcohols work. Those are also big red flags that we don't want to use those. Acids, Acids yeah, still the same thing. When we looked at our carbonyl chemistry, when we looked with uh, car our oxygen as a nucleophile, we had hydrogens coming on and off, each of those intermediates, a lot. Where were those hydrogens coming from? What were they being pulled off by? They're coming from the solvent or our solution. So when we're looking at the solvent for our Grignard reagent, what kind of solvent do we absolutely not want? Protic solvents. So we go all the way back to our SN1 and SN2 definitions. We had polar, nonpolar, protic, aprotic. Okay? Our solvent must be aprotic, meaning it does not have an easily acidic hydrogen. Okay? Because if it does, the reaction is nullified and we don't get the Grignard reaction that we want. Okay? Should it be polar or nonpolar? That one's a harder question. What can you tell me about that species there? We'll come back to H3O plus in a second. The one I just circled while you were looking the other way. CH3 minus. What charge does it have? Negative. How stable is that? Not very stable at all. Okay. So it's going to have a very high energy, which means it's also not very likely to happen. If I want that species present to react with my carbonyl, I'm going to have to stabilize it. What solvent is going to stabilize it best? A polar one. If I use an aprotic solvent, it does not stabilize the charge, which means I go back to the halogenated species. And the magnesium stays as a metal, and I don't get a reaction. So when we're looking for our solvents, we want aprotic absolutely, but it still has to be polar. The most common solvent used is diethyl ether, abbreviated ET2O. Okay, just so you're aware. Diethyl ether. That's used in yeah, that's the most common solvent used for these. For carbon as a Grignard reactions. How do you spell it? Whoops. Grignard. What was the other question there? So, 
That only applies with carbons, though, right? Yes. This is strictly a carbon reaction. <coughs> Wasn't the oxygen reaction a Grignard reaction? Too? No. Grignard is, by definition, looking at organo uh, metallic or organo uh, magnesium halides. But you asked, okay, so you asked us about that last week. You said gaming. Yeah. We started on it. We had just started on the carbon nucleophiles, yes. Okay. Questions about your Grignard reagents? Okay, what's the bottom line lesson that you need to remember from that? Solvents need to be aprotic and polar. What else? Our Grignard reagent, our negative carbon will act as our nucleophile, okay, with our carbonyls, okay? Um, the next part is looking at nitrogen as nucleophiles because I think this reaction is going to be particularly relevant for you. Uh, I'm going to draw it on the computer and show it to you on Thursday. So we'll finish that one on Thursday. Um, also, we don't really have enough time to talk through all of that. The other possibility, this would be looking at reduction, so we'll just mention this real quickly. We could also have hydrogen as a nucleophile. To be a nucleophile, what charge does that hydrogen need to be? Negative. How do we get a hydrogen to be negative? How many electrons would it have? Do we call it hydrogen ion anymore? Nope. What do we call it? Hydride. H can go through an attack. What ends up happening in this case? We could then acidify, put on our hydrogen, so we still get our alcohol. What kind of reaction could we say occurred here? Right idea. Oxidation means we increase the oxygen bonds. Do we increase them? No, we decreased. So what we'd be looking at is a reduction. So we can, I would accept addition on this case, though technically not. It depends on the source of hydrogen negative. The most common sources of that species would be borohydride, BH4 minus, and lithium aluminum hydride, L, that one. I can't even say all the letters in sequence. Um, and in those cases, actually, yeah, it does still qualify as addition. Okay, so that would be your reduction. Um, yes, it ends up being a sin addition. All right, that's under your redox chemistry, which I said you aren't ultimately responsible for, but I wanted to at least say it so you know it's there. We can have hydrogen act as a nucleophile in these cases. Extra stuff, carboxylic acids. The one thing that I didn't get to yet, and that will show up on the slides, is the nomenclature for carboxylic acids. Anybody remember, priority-wise, where are carboxylic acids? Highest priority, okay? Which means when we go through to name a compound with a carboxylic acid, it's always ending in ic acid, okay? So you got benzoic acid, propanoic acid, okay? You always get that ic acid added on there, okay? Um, the amines, well, let's not quite do the amines yet. What kind of reactivity would you expect of carboxylic acids? Acidic. Acidic, so Bronsted-Lowry acids. Okay. Amines, what kind of chemistry would you expect of amines? Base. Amines are primarily Bronsted-Lowry bases. We can see them act as nucleophiles. We did see that, or we will see that, um, but our primary concern with those is that they're acting as bases. And we've also added little statement here about funky carbonyls, okay? I'll just kind of leave you with this as some reactivity here. Turns out that if I take, say, a structure like acetone and I add a strong base, hydroxide, that these two undergo a reaction, okay? We might say, oh, well, we get a reaction like this. Okay, which was along the acetal lines. That oxygen attacks our positive carbonyl. 
We can put acetal in quotes. Okay, well, that's really, really unstable. That doesn't typically happen. Okay, there's another thing that can happen there, and this is where it gets a bit tricky. OH minus is what kind of a species? Bronsted Lowry base. For it to act as a base, what does it typically react with? Hydrogens, right? Where are there hydrogens in our carbonyl structure? A carbon atom further away, because the central carbon doesn't have any hydrogens. Okay? Why is that important? Well, what ends up happening is that hydrogen does become slightly acidic. Why would that hydrogen be acidic? Because, that's a good answer. It's attached to a carbon that's... So the carbons are pulling the electrons from it. So that carbon would be negative. Is that primary negative charge particularly stable? No. How could I stabilize a charge? How do you stabilize all charges? Add the opposite charge. But if we, we want to look only within this structure, begins with an R, we're going to do resonance. So let's move the electrons the only place we can. We can only move them towards that carbon. How many bonds would that carbon then have? Too many. So what do we do? We move it to the oxygen. Why is this important? What did I just draw other than that goofy line? I have a resonance structure. Why is that important? What does that mean about the acidity of that initial hydrogen? It's more acidic because we have resonance to stabilize our conjugate base. Okay? This is an equilibrium reaction. In most circumstances, we favor the carbonyl. Very, very rarely do you ever see the other form form, or that was terribly phrased, the other forms or the other part? Any ideas on what name we might call this one? That's where it gets tricky. What functional group is this? An alkene, so we'll refer to it as an ene. What functional group does that start to look an awful lot like? We have an enol. The relationship here is the keto enol tautomerization. Okay? That explains a lot of chemistry that you will probably see in biochemistry. Good luck with that. Except in biochemistry, they aren't going to tell you to understand where it's coming from. They'll just tell you to memorize it. Okay? And they probably won't even tell you to memorize the structure. They'll probably just tell you this is the name of the compound. Memorize that it goes to this. Okay? For sure, you took it here, though. Okay? So that tautomerization is really, really important for biochemistry. All of the carbonyl chapter minus the Grignard reagents is important for biochem. Okay? If you've got questions, feel free to ask, and I will go ahead and stop.